to Children's Church and our nursery kids to the nursery. Take your book. Moses one time was standing in the middle of an airport. Clearly, this is a joke. Um, and George W. Bush walks into the airport. Yeah. Um, and George W. Bush looks over and sees, my goodness, that looks just like I've always imagined Moses would look. You know, the, the huge white beard, kind of like the guys of Duck Dynasty, you know. Um, but, but he just knows it's Moses. So George W. Bush is like, all right, Secret Service, come on, we got to go talk. To, I've got to go find out what's going on here. So he walks over to Moses and says, hey, you're Moses, right? And Moses kind of looks up at the ceiling, won't look at him. Hey, hey, you're Moses, Are, you're, right? Are, can you hear me? Moses just keeps looking around. I'm the president of the United States. I'm talking to you. You're Moses, aren't you? And Moses looked at him and says, yes, I'm Moses. But the last time I talked to a bush, I ended up wandering through the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're talking about this morning. We're talking about Moses. Moses. Are you guys excited about studying God's Word? What you hold in your hands is one of God's greatest gifts to mankind. What a privilege to hold this book. This morning we are concluding our series through Hebrews chapter 11. So we're still in Hebrews chapter 11. This week we're going to be reading verses 23 through 28. If you are using a few Bible this morning, this is page number 175 of your New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 23-28. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful <coughs> child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne this morning, Lord, we pray that you would be in our midst. Lord, I pray that you would use this time of study to, to transform our lives, Lord. Lord, I pray that, that the Spirit would speak strongly to our hearts this morning, that we would listen. Lord, we pray for all of those who, for various reasons, were unable to be here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would comfort the physically afflicted. Lord, I pray that you would you would comfort the spiritually afflicted. Lord, I pray that, that in all things that, that we, your people, would, uh, would love you and love each other. Please bless us as we study in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Alright, guys. What started six weeks ago ends today. We looked at the life of Enoch. We looked at the life of Noah. We looked at the life of Abraham, then we looked at the life of his wife, Sarah. And then last week, we studied the life of Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph, who rose to prominence in Egypt, and who at the end of his life said, Whenever you leave here, make sure you take my bones with you to the promised land. He was looking for a better city, a better country. He was looking for heaven. Well, things at first went pretty well for the children of Egypt in the land of or the children of Israel, the land of Egypt. Things were going pretty well for them. But after a certain amount of time, for political reasons unbeknownst to us, the Egyptians began to enslave the children of Israel. The children of Israel kept growing more and more and more populous, but the Egyptians just enslaved them. Finally, after approximately 400 years, the children of Israel at this point, there's literally millions of them, I'm pretty sure they outnumbered the Egyptians. And the Egyptian Pharaoh said, we've got to do something about this. So Pharaoh gave an edict that said that all baby boys 
had to be murdered at birth. If he had a baby boy, kill it. If he had a baby girl, well, she could live. Well, verse 23 tells us that Moses' parents had him, and they knew the king's command, but they saw that he was a beautiful child. Now, guys, every set of parents in the world thinks that their baby is beautiful, even though those of us on the outside know that not all of them are. <laughs> when I was real young, my family went to Colorado to visit my dad's best friend from high school. Uh, they had just had a new baby, and, and so we went out there not to see the baby. It just so happened they had a new baby. Um, and I was three, so I don't really remember the trip. But, but as the story goes, my grandma, who is a, is a very frank and very honest person, she's not going to lie to you, they hand her this baby who, for all intents and purposes, is, is not one of those beautiful babies you see on commercials. And she looks at this baby, and she thinks, my goodness, I've got to tell them something nice about this child. It is my civic duty to say something nice about this child. So she looks at this baby, and looks and looks, and says, my goodness, this child has such beautiful ears. <laughs> has beautiful ears. Guys, it, it seems like from Scripture that Moses must have been a pretty good-looking baby. But either, either way, all parents think their baby's beautiful, and, but Moses' parents, they realize there's something special about him. And so the Bible says that they were not afraid of Pharaoh's edict. They weren't afraid of the command of the king. Keep that phrase in mind, so we're going to see that phrase later on in verse 27. So do you remember what they did from the story of Exodus? They... His mother, when he was about three months old, made a basket of reeds and floated them down the Nile River and told his older sister Miriam, you follow this basket and what becomes of him. I mean, he could have sank, he could have drowned. Uh, he could have been found and, and just said, oh, it's clearly a Hebrew baby trying to avoid death. You know, anything could have happened, but God had a plan. And the Bible tells us that the daughter of Pharaoh saw the baby floating down the river and it seems like she probably didn't have any kids. And so she adopted Moses and, and named him Moses. Moses means to, to draw up out of the water. So she drew him out of the water and named him Moses. And Moses' sister Miriam ran up to the, the Pharaoh's daughter. And obviously they didn't have formula in these days. You know, nursing was the only way to feed a child. And she said, hey, I see you're adopting this baby. Would you like me to find someone that can nurse him for you? Pharaoh's daughter said, yes, that'd be wonderful. So you know the story. Mary went back and got Moses' own mother. And so Moses' mother got to raise him, essentially, in Pharaoh's palace. So here's Moses. He, raised, he grows up. He becomes a great man. And what we're going to see this morning, and these are going to be the blanks on the back of your bulletin, is that Moses, at some point in his life, when he was an adult, when he was a grown man, able to make decisions for himself, he made the conscious decision to give up his, his heritage as an Egyptian, to give up everything that it meant to be the daughter of the Pharaoh, or the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he chose to identify himself with the people of God. And this morning, from these verses, I want to point out to you, first, what Moses gave up, and then second, why he did it. So the first thing that I see that Moses gave up this morning is found in verse 24. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. My friends, the first thing Moses gave up this morning is that Moses gave up his career goals. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that, that this particular Pharaoh only had one child, a daughter. And that this particular child, this daughter, only had one child, the adopted Moses. Now, if Josephus is correct, which we don't know that he is, he was, he was a fairly good historian. But if Josephus is correct, that means that Moses was in line to one day be Pharaoh. If Moses could keep his trap shut and keep going with the status quo, just saying he's an Egyptian, even though he knew he was a Hebrew, that he might have been the future Pharaoh. And even if Josephus is wrong, you know that Moses had it made. Moses, he was living the life of luxury. At the very least, he was the grandson 
of the supreme ruler of the most powerful empire on earth at that time. So whenever Moses made a decision to identify himself with the people of God, whenever Moses decided to follow God, I just want you to notice this morning, he gave up his career goals. All of the future, the light ahead of him, whatever that future was, he forsook that to follow God. This morning, I don't know what God's plan is for you when it comes to employment. But I want us to ask ourselves the probing question, what would you do if following Jesus meant losing your job? What would you do if following Jesus meant passing up a promotion? These are the sorts of questions we need to ask ourselves as we count the cost this morning. The second thing that I see that Moses gave up is found in verse 25, the first half of the verse. Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God. What do we know about the children of Israel in these days in Egypt? They were slaves. Moses chose to give up being the, the dominant, the, 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 the oppressor, and chose to identify himself with the oppressed. Now we know from the book of Exodus that there was a very specific event in Moses' life that the author of Hebrews is talking about here. The Bible tells us that when Moses was about 40 years old, he was out walking one day, and he saw an Egyptian slave master about beating a Hebrew to death. And so the Bible literally says that Moses looked around, made sure no one was watching, and he went and killed that Egyptian. And then he went and buried him in the sand. So I'm thankful that we don't have any rites of passage like that whenever we decide to follow God. Whenever Moses made the commitment to join the people of God, for him, it meant physically saving this Hebrew slave. So Moses was going from being, not he wasn't necessarily a slave owner, but he went from being the, the comfortable people to identifying himself with the slaves. I'm convinced that, that most of us as human beings we love fitting in, don't we? I think we love blending into the crowd. The old Chinese proverb, the nail that sticks up the highest gets beaten down. I prefer to not stick out as a sore thumb in my life. When I was in 8th grade, and I've probably shared this with you before, but 8th grade was kind of my, my year of rebellion. In 8th grade, I knew Jesus Christ as my Savior. But for the life of me, I didn't want anyone else to know it. Like a hunter, I wanted to soak myself in deer urine so that the, the, I, I could blend in with the world around me. You see what I'm saying? I was covering my life with sin so I could blend in with the world around me. But my friends, the message of the gospel is that when Jesus calls us out of the world, we're going to look different. We can't blend in anymore. We're going to stick out like sore thumbs. So just as you ask yourself, what would you do if following Jesus cost you your, your job? What would you do if following Christ cost you your comfort? What would you do if following Christ meant that the people around you that you really want to like you, they don't anymore? It cost Moses his comfort zone. The third thing that I want you to notice that it comes to Moses, it's found in the second half of verse 25. Choosing rather to endure ill treatment of the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. We don't know what those passing pleasures would have been like in Moses' life. I'm fairly confident that as a, as a grown man in Pharaoh's household, he probably would have had access to some sort of harem of his own. He probably would have had an open bar in his life. Moses could have basically done whatever sin he wanted to. But the Bible says that whenever he chose to follow God, he was forsaking the temporary pleasures <coughs> of sin. And while we're not going to get into specifics this morning, I think we all know that for, 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 for all of us have our different temptations, sin can be very pleasurable for a moment. Sin is like an Oreo cookie in the hands of my daughter, Zoe. It tastes really good, but about 30 seconds, the enjoyment's gone, and there is a mess everywhere. That's what sin is like in the life of the believer. There is that pleasure, but that pleasure is quickly gone, and what's left 
is a big mess. So earlier I asked you, what would you do if Jesus calls you your job? What would you do if Jesus calls you your comfort? My friend, I don't have to ask, what would you do if Jesus calls you your sin? Jesus will cost you your sin. That's just part of the gospel. You see, there's this horrible heresy that says that, that all it means to follow Jesus is to just, just think a few things about him in your head. If you understand the gospel, or if you understand that Jesus died and rose from the dead, if you just believe those things, that's all it means to be a follower of Christ. But do you remember that scene from Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus walks up to the Sea of Galilee, and he sees some fishermen out on the lake, Peter and John and James and Andrew. And in Matthew 4, 19, does Jesus call out to them and say, Hey, you guys, I want you to believe in me. All right, have a nice day. No. Jesus says, Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Guys, when we make a decision to know Jesus Christ, to follow him, we are necessarily choosing to forsake the temporary pleasures of sin. Yes, I mess up. But I can never, never say that I love my sin more than I love my Savior. And my life should never reflect that. Following Jesus will cost us the temporary, fleeting pleasures of sin. And so the question is this morning, why on earth would Moses, this prince of Egypt, why would he forsake everything? Why would he forsake his riches? Why would he forsake all of the endless opportunities that were spread out before him? And why would he trade all of that in to become a member of the oppressed? Why would he trade all of that in to not just live a normal life, but to live a life of suffering? Guys, why don't we all just go home right now, forget this whole Jesus thing, and let's just go and live our lives to the best of our ability, making ourselves as reasonably happy as possible, and just handling our destiny on our own? Why don't we do that? Aren't you thankful the scripture has the answer to those questions? Do you want to know why Moses thought it was worth it to be a part of the people of God? Do you want to know why I think it's worth it? To forsake all else and be a part of the people of God? These verses give us three reasons. And these are the second set of three blanks on the backs of your bulletins. The first one is also found in verse 26. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward. He was looking to the reward. My friends, the first reason this morning that following Jesus Christ is worth whatever cost he has me to pay is that we have the promise of heaven. I love what verse 26 says. For Moses was looking up at that reward. Literally in the Greek, uh, it's not just that he was just glancing from time to time. Literally in the Greek, it's that he was staring. He was having a staring contest with heaven. His eyes were on the prize. And when he looked forward and saw the promise of God for eternal life, it was worth it to have the reproach of Christ. Literally, instead of the word reproach, reproach, I would choose the word insult from the Greek. Moses was willing to take on the insult, the, the same sort of insult that Jesus Christ took. And literally, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Blessed are you when you are, the same word in the Greek, insulted and reviled because of me. I hope you guys know that suffering is not an if in the life of the Christian. If you know Jesus Christ, and if you are sticking out like a sore thumb in a world that hates the gospel, then you will suffer for it. But the first reason that I see from this text is that when we gaze at the future promise of heaven, all of the present suffering that we're going to go through, all of a sudden it doesn't start to seem quite so miserable. The promise of heaven keeps us going in the midst of the troubles that come with following Jesus Christ. 
The second reason that we follow Jesus Christ this morning is because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Look at what verse 27 says. The presence of the Holy Spirit. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, for he persevered, as seeing him who is unseen. So the second reason why Moses decided to be a part of the people of God is he saw him who is unseen. Literally in the Greek, as if seeing the invisible one. Guys, how cool would it be to have been like Moses and to literally have heard God talking from the burning bush? That would be wild, wouldn't it? How cool would it have been to have been like Moses and to climb up on Mount Sinai and to see the hand of the living God writing out the tablets of the Ten Commandments? How cool would it have been to have like Moses to have had our, our bodies hid in the cleft of the rock and the Bible says the glory of the Lord passed by him and even that mere glimpse made it so that his face shone like the rays of the sun. In our men's Bible study, we've been studying the book Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman. And Kyle Eidelman brings up this beautiful point that so many times as Christians, we find ourselves being jealous of those guys in the Old Testament. How cool, I mean, let's be honest though, how cool would it have been to like Abraham, for God to say, Abraham, get out of your country and follow me. He literally heard him. What would it have been like to be Elijah, to be caught up in the whirlwind with chariots of fire, or to be like Elisha and to have seen this great event happen? What would it have been like to have been like Joseph, and be given divine dreams and the special gift of interpreting the divine dreams of other people? What would it have been like to be like Daniel and to be thrown in that lion's den? Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to be thrown in that furnace only to find that there's a fourth man in there with you. Someone who looked like a son of God. Guys, I find myself wishing, Lord, why can I not have these experiences? But you want to know the thing about Moses? He had to climb up on the top of a mountain to be with God. He had to go out to the middle of the desert to be with God. It was as if he saw him who was the invisible one. But my friends, I don't have to go on top of a mountain to be with God. God lives in me. God lives in you. If anything, guys, we've got it better off than they did. Yeah, Elijah got to go up into heaven to whirlwind. But before that, he did not get to experience God in the same way that we experience God on a daily basis. You want to know one of the reasons why it is so worth it to follow Jesus Christ? Because what we've sacrificed is the temporary pleasures of sin. Those temporary things that all it leaves in our lives is, is the mess of shame and guilt. And what we've gained after sacrificing that is the insurmountable joy of having the living God of the universe dwell within our bodies. That is awesome. Sometimes it's bad this. Anytime someone says the word Holy Spirit, we kind of shut down and say, all right, everyone, now let's calm down a little bit. But guys, I am excited that we have the Holy Spirit in our lives. Do you realize how cool this is? What a blessing. So anytime you're wondering, is it worth it? Is it worth the cost that Christ asks of me to follow him? Guys, it's pretty cool having the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's pretty cool having the problems of heaven. And it's pretty cool having the presence of the Spirit. Look at verse 28 with me. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. You know the story. Moses is a shepherd in the wilderness. He's in the land of Midian for 40 years. God speaks to him out of the burning bush and says, You need to go back to Egypt and you need to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. After a considerable amount of coaxing, Moses and his brother Abraham go back to Egypt, and after a series of nine plagues, Moses and Aaron tell Pharaoh one more time, what did I say? Abraham. <laughs> I probably 
I've been doing that a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're paying attention. To that. <laughs> uh, in some places, like I could say, you know, Tiger Woods went back to Egypt. Went, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. Uh, so Moses and Aaron go back to Egypt, and after nine plagues, they tell Pharaoh once again, "Let my people go." And Pharaoh says, "No." And so God says, "There's going to be one last plague, and it's going to do the trick." He said, "What's going to happen is." I'm going to send the destroyer, the angel of death, throughout all the land of Egypt. And in every household, the firstborn son is going to die. It's going to be horrible. <coughs> and he said, here's what you can do to survive this great cataclysm. I want you to take a lamb without blemish, a perfect spotless lamb, you're going to take it into your house, and you're going to sacrifice that lamb with your family. And you're going to go and take the blood of that lamb and spread it on the doorpost of your house. And on the night when the angel of death rampages through the land of Egypt, if you have the blood on your doorpost, then death will pass over you on that night. And this is why it's called the Passover. And from that year on, every year for the rest of Moses' life, he kept, every year they had a feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this feast where they would celebrate the Passover to remind them of the price that had been paid in the land of Egypt. Literally in the Greek, uh, I don't know why our Bible say he kept the Passover, because in the Greek it's the perfect tense, which means it's something that started in the past and continues on to the present. I have been a Cardinals fan for a long time. I was in the past, and I still am today. Literally in the Greek, it says, Moses has been keeping the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. You see, it became something Moses did for the rest of his life. And every time he did it, it reminded him of the price that was paid. Guys, you want to know the third and most important reason why I think it's worth it to follow Jesus Christ today? It's on the back of your bulletin. It's because of the price that he paid. There are several stories in the Old Testament that are beautiful examples of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. <coughs> they're archetypes. They, they, they're foreshadowing. They look forward to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. One of the most beautiful in all of Scripture is the story of the Passover. Just as the Jews took the spotless lamb and sacrificed it and covered the doorposts of their house in his blood, so also the spotless Lamb of God came down and made himself a sacrifice. And the Bible tells us that whoever is covered by the blood of the Lamb is saved from death. Do you see the parallels there? And so for Moses, every year he remembered that Passover, remembered the price that was paid. And in the same way, we as followers of Jesus Christ, we must never forget the price that was paid so that we could be saved from our sins. You want to know why the suffering that I go through as a Christian doesn't really matter that much to me? Because it pales in comparison to the suffering that he went through for me. Guys, I might get laughed at a little bit. But I've never had a crown of thorns shoved on my head. Is it possible that one day I could be passed up for promotion or lose a job or even be beat up? Yep, it's possible. But I'm never going to be the sinless Lamb of God that went through indescribable suffering for people who didn't even like Him. The cost of following Christ is worth it whenever we look forward to the promise of heaven. Whenever we know the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And when we look back to the price that He paid on Calvary. Guys, I know that sometimes being a Christian is hard. Some of you are going through some hard stuff right now. But when we realize promise of heaven, the presence of the Spirit, and the price that he paid, not only does the cost seem worth it, but the cost kind of fades.
Guys, it is a sacrifice following Christ, but I am convinced that when compared to the insurmountable privilege of knowing Him, the cost is nothing. I believe that whenever Moses was encountered with the truth of knowing God, forsaking his Egyptian identity and becoming a part of the people of God was the only thing that made sense. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Friends, this is the grand finale to our series of the Hall of Faith. And the one message I want you to take over from not just today's sermon, but the entire series, is that great truth of the Bible, we have been saved by grace through faith. There is no amount of works you can ever do to earn merit with God. You are saved by faith. And yet what you notice in the life of every one of these saints is that faith was not the end of their journey. Faith was the beginning of it. By faith, Enoch walked with God in the midst of a world who hated God. By faith, Noah spent 120 years building an ark. By faith, Abraham left everyone and everything he knew behind, searching for the promised land. By faith, Sarah overcame her past uh, situations, overcame her past skeletons, to place her trust in God. By faith, Joseph learned to long for the things that truly matter. And by faith, Moses counted the cost and forsook everything about Egypt and became a son of the living God. Guys, I know you. And I believe that probably every person here is a born-again follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My prayer is that in the story of your lives, the first two words will be, by faith. The question is, what are you going to do by faith? My prayer is that like Moses, you are willing, more than willing, to give up whatever God asks you to, because I promise you, he'll ask you to give up stuff that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. What are you going to do for him? Don't forget what he did for us. And if you are here this morning, you've never trusted in Jesus Christ. Maybe, maybe we've thought you were saved for years and years, and maybe for whatever reason you just never have made that leap of faith. If you are here this morning and never trusted in Him, I pray that this will be the day. I pray that this will be the day you can mark in your Bibles that I finally did it. Or if you're a Christian, this will be the day you mark in your Bibles, this is the day, God. This is the day where I'm choosing to crucify my sin, where I'm choosing to forsake all else in a passionate pursuit of your kingdom and your glory. Make this the day that you choose Him. As our pianist comes forward, I know that in the church family today, there's a variety of burdens, there's a variety of things going on, and probably there's a variety of commitments that we need to make to our God and King. Obviously, you don't have to come to the altars to make that commitment. But if you want to, the altars are open for you. Whether you're in your pew, you're at the altar, you're in your vehicle on the ride home, you're at the grocery store, whatever God asks of you, by faith, do it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, your people, come before your throne just, just begging you, Lord, to help us to love you more, to help us to follow you more diligently. Lord Jesus, you ask us to give up some stuff. The Lord is just stuff. Lord, I am convinced that the privilege of knowing you makes everything else so minor that giving it up is, is nothing. Lord, like the man who, who found a treasure out in the field, sold everything he had so he could buy that field and claim that treasure as his own. Lord Jesus, our life. Our life is so expendable. Lord, may we, may we give it all.